What do you do when you get into a debate about something like, say, not eating meat? But before you get into the discussion, you know there just ain't no way you're gonna give up the delicious taste of juicy, medium rare steak with some A1 sauce. However, you also know that flat out admitting that you're closed minded will cost you some social credibility. At this point, you may be lost and have no idea what to do. Well, fret no more, my friend, because you're in for a treat. I'm Clay, and this is the world's first beginner's guide to doing the Dillahunty Dodge. In this short training video, I'm going to teach you three surefire ways to dodge your opponent's facts and arguments when you get into the red zone. Today, we'll be taking you through a virtual tour of how Matt Dillahunty dodged the conclusion that he didn't like in his conversation with Cosmic Skeptic, and then we'll show you how he implements these exact same tactics in other debates, such as his recent debate with Dr. David Wood. By the end of this lesson, you will learn the secret tips and tricks for dodging not only inconvenient conclusions, but also your most explicit contradictions. So go ahead and give me a bit of your time and I'll make you a pro dodger in no time. So, dodge team, are you ready to duck and dodge? Well, that's excellent, wonderful. Well, let's go. Aside from debating religious people, Matt Dillahunty is also a professional magician. But that doesn't mean that what he's doing has to look like magic. We'll make the mysterious look simple by breaking down some of his most used tactics down into three easy to remember steps that you can perform yourself. All you need to do is remember the three SBCs of dodging. SBC stands for social fame, blame, and change. And if you're lucky enough to make it to the master level at the end of this course, you'll even learn the secret to the Dillahunty power tool Shame. Let's start with taking a look at how Dillahunty recently got himself into a pretty tough bind. In his recent conversation with Cosmic Skeptic, Cosmic started the discussion by talking about the ethical system of humanism that Dillahunty and Cosmic both agree on. Cosmic then built off of their agreed upon principles in order to show Dillahunty that he'd be morally inconsistent if he chose not to become a vegan. Now, it's clear from the conversation that it only took Dillahunty one quick thought about some mouth-watering Kentucky Fried Chicken before he realized there was no way that he was going to change his mind on eating meat. The only problem was, he and Cosmic share most of the same fan base, and the fan base not only loves Cosmic probably more than they do Dillahunty, but they seem to respect Cosmic's position on not eating meat as well. Oh no! What is he going to do? Looks like Dilla Hunty got himself into a Dilla Funky. Let's take a look. Which is this. Let's say, let's say it happens. I prove to you beyond a shadow of a doubt that when a calf is separated from its mother forcibly, it undergoes psychological stress. Sim a, a comparable level of psychological stress to, to if you did it to a human. Would you stop drinking milk? Even, if, even with the caveat of saying I'm not necessarily against all forms of animal slaughter, and even with the caveat of saying there are certain people who can't go vegan, well, those don't apply to you. So why, why bring them up when talking about, like, for instance, why, why you're not a vegan? You have contributed to an industry that is that you've, you've already said you think is, is almost certainly objectively wrong. Yeah. But you've done so in such a way that could have been so easily rectified just so easily by just choosing something else on the menu. Yikes, looks like Dillahunty is in a pretty bad spot. What does Matt Dillahunty need to do when he's in a tough spot? That's right. Looks like he needs to do the Dillahunty Dodge. Dodge. But how is the Dillahunty Dodge done? <laughs> I'm glad you asked. Let's get into today's lesson. Now we will start with the first tactic and add on others along the way. Tactic number one, dodge with social fame. The idea here for when you're using this tactic is always frame with social fame. In today's SJW driven world, nothing gives you social fame like appealing to things that feel and sound morally virtuous. 
In today's debate sphere, socially uncomfortable facts just don't cut it. When is the last time that you've seen celebrities virtue signal by giving an emotionless rant with some boring and socially inconvenient facts? That's what I thought. The key here is to realize that in today's culture, feelings just don't care about your facts. But with so much whining and so many feelings at our disposal, how do we know which ones to use? <laughs> well, the answer to that question is any that make you sound socially virtuous. Now, when you're in a jam, the trick is to affirm any and all claims that sound or feel morally and socially virtuous, even if they lead you to be committed to views that go against your entire position. Remember, social virtue is king. Now let's see how Dillahunty implements this tool. Okay, so let's, so let's apply the test to see if this is really actually relevant to, to your views, okay. which is this. Let's say, let's say it happens. I prove to you beyond a shadow of a doubt that when a calf is separated from its mother forcibly, it undergoes psychological stress. Sim a, a comparable level of psychological stress to, to if you did it to a human. Would you stop drinking milk? Sure. You would? Yes. Just based on, based on that alone. So the only thing that's stopping you isn't isn't like a is isn't a, a a quibble about whether the ethics actually sort of applies to them. It's like no, that's if, when. So that's where, so the whole issue is where do you draw the line? But okay, the the, re, the reason I find this so interesting is because like we know that animals suffer in the slaughterhouses. Yes. So in and the I'm same, on record as being opposed to that. As you can see, rejecting these virtuous sounding claims would force him to take a significant blow to his social bank account. Given that most people today tend to care more about feelings of virtue than socially awkward facts, Dillahunty made the right move, despite the fact that he ended up conceding every critical point that Cosmic needed in order to beat him in the debate. So the lesson here is that if you have to pick between sounding like a moral monster or conceding detrimental points to your position, Always affirm what sounds socially superior. Remember, your guiding principle is, if you don't accept what sounds virtuous, it will only cause turbulence. More on this later. For now, here's the do's and don'ts for tactic number one. Do agree with any and all social virtues that your supporters emotionally accept, even if they go against your entire position. Don't deny those social virtues at any cost. Doing so has the potential to socially bankrupt you. Remember, social currency is important, and if you're broke, no one will ever take you seriously when it comes time to punch your money where your mouth is. Tactic number two, dodge with change. If you end up cornered, the mindset here is, dang, it's time for a subject change. If you find yourself needing to use this step, it's clear that you're obviously grasping for straws and doing your best to maintain face, but others don't have to know that. Your secret's safe with me. Your goal here is to start scanning for the exit door and get to it as fast as you can. If for some reason you've accidentally logically committed yourself to the conclusion that you're trying to avoid, you need to find a way to prevent your opponent from making it too obvious that the real issue is that you just don't want to change your mind. Or in this case, the issue may be that vegan burgers taste like seasoned cardboard. Now let's see what Dillahunty does when Cosmic exposes the fact that once again, Dillahunty has already logically committed himself to the necessary premises needed to accept Cosmic's conclusion. Now I, I'm under the impression, you, you said many times that like your, your aim, your, your goal almost, I, I see it almost as like a motto of, of what you do is to know as many true things as possible. And as few false things. Right. Now, equally, you, you think that morality it ha like lives within the realm of objectivity and truth. And so it seems to follow... Sure. That, well, moral valuations. Yeah, so yeah. it seems to follow that if it's true that uh, that eating, killing and eating animals for food is immoral, then you want to know it. Yes. Right? So let's unpack this. Firstly, I, I agree with everything you've said. Like, for instance, the ability to go vegan on a practical level is not available to everybody. And secondly, you don't need to be opposed necessarily. I mean, I would I, it's, it's a gray area for me, but you don't need to be opposed to all ways in which animals are killed, just the horrendous forms in which they're killed. Sure. Uh, but given that, you live in a city, you, you live in an area where it's, where it's perfectly possible to go vegan, and equally, 99% of all of the animals that end up on the plates of Americans comes from factory farming. Yep. So, 
even if, even with the caveat of saying I'm not necessarily against all forms of animal slaughter, and even with the caveat of saying there are certain people who can't go vegan, well, those don't apply to you. So why why bring them up when talking about like for instance why why you're not a vegan? Why bring up those those considerations when those don't apply to you? Well, at this point, I know you're probably thinking game over. He only has three options here. He can go back on what he previously said and lose some social cred. He can admit defeat and say goodbye to Big Mouth Burgers for the rest of his life, or he can do the Dillahunty Dutch. Dutch. Why bring up those those considerations when those don't apply to you? Well, it's a direct response to a specific simplistic challenge that I've been presented oh, okay. with on the show. But it's not a response to the whole issue at all. Yeah. And there you have it. We can call this move, don't get dissed, pretend that the point was missed. The tactic here is to make them think that you were talking about something else all along. This tactic can also be easily used if you want to flip the virtue burden of proof as well and accuse the other person of committing a straw man. The next guiding principle that we're going to look at is, before you look like a dummy, oh look, it's a bunny. The point of this tactic is to divert attention off of yourself by changing the subject entirely. Now let's see how Dillahunty masterfully utilizes this technique when he gets cornered once again. A few times you said, you know, I've got, I've got no reason to believe why it's not morally virtuous to, to be a vegan. Can we rephrase that? Is it morally virtuous to be a vegan? See, and that's where we get in, into the complexity because I, just talking about virtue here, and, and I don't necessarily, and I know there there are there are there are complex issues, but somebody who at the end of the day, I care more about humans than other animals. Now, don't get me wrong, that clip was fantastic. But it should also be noted that when you change the subject, the longer that you can keep talking, the better. Your goal is to keep talking so long that people will forget that you changed the subject in the first place, or maybe even get distracted by following something else that you said. Remember, the longer you talk about something else as a diversion tactic, the better. Now let's see how Dillahunty skillfully owns this move when Cosmic questions him on if the only reason that he doesn't want to give up meat is simply because he likes to taste. Can you see how people see the, 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 in, in precisely the same way the idea that rather than just being a moral virtue not to kill and eat animals because mm. it benefits you in, in terms of taste, to just say, well, that's trivial sens sensual pleasure and that is not enough to escape. Oh, I absolutely see how people can do that. By the way, it's... But that's not, that's not something you, you do. That's not, a, that's not a view that you take. Well, I'm sure it is in some sense... Saying I can understand how people see it that way doesn't necessarily mean that I agree, but also the, course, fr yeah. the framing of it as uh, taste being the only factor, I think, is a gross oversimplification. If, by and large, it's only in the modern world, in cities and things like that, that one truly has access to the privileged status to be vegan. Uh -huh. for, the, for most of our history and in most places... That just wasn't an option. You, you know, there were health issues and other things. I am, for the record, opposed to the way we go about getting food on many occasions, meat. Mm -hmm. um, I'm opposed to animal torture and animal cruelty. However, when I point that out, uh, there are ethical vegans who say, well, you know, killing it's cruel, no matter whether it suffers or not. And I'm not necessarily sure. That, the thing is, I don't think we can boil anything down so neatly because... Even if you ate a purely vegan diet, if you walk behind a combine harvesting food, we're doing a lot of destruction to animals, you know, not just insects, but, you know, voles and varmints and things like that live out there, yep. physically killing them and disrupting a habitat. So I think it's, it's kind of a little bit of cherry picking in some sense to say, oh, I'm doing this and it's better. It, it gets into the... I would never, so I don't have a problem with veganism, which was one of the why, one of the reasons why this keeps coming up. As a matter of fact, uh, I'm, I'm mostly pescatarian at this point. I think you said at one point that you do consider it to be a moral virtue. You think it, it is a good thing. I, I am to convinced do. that it's likely a moral virtue. Okay. Um, I don't. It's, it's you know, I, the variables are so complex that I and I haven't spent that much time actually <laughs> digging in on it. Mm -hmm. But. 
for, I know people who do it for health reasons. I know people who do it for ethical reasons and I don't have any objection. My, my lone objection was to ethical vegans who say, if you eat meat, you are an immoral person. Yeah. And then failing to back that up with an understanding of morality that fits in with sure. what I accept. And for, for the record, I, I don't think you're an immoral person for eating meat. I just think that what you're doing is immoral. Uh, that now, I can see. Look, there's, because there's, you're, you're talking about an, an immoral virtue sense. Or there, there's no, a lot, what you're there's doing, a lot to unpack. There's what you're doing unpack, is, yeah. is doing the, the same thing I do uh, in other scenarios, which is if I say you're a liar, I have a friend of mine who if you tell him he's a liar, that's the worst thing you could ever say because to him, being called a liar is a complete assessment of his character and worth as a person. Mm -hmm. When I say you're a liar, I just mean you're human. Every, right. every human's going to lie. And I don't tend to assess the entirety of someone's character. As a matter of fact, I don't even know how to do that. Like the, the old adage that, you know, well, Hitler probably loved his mother. And you can find something positive about somebody. Is there a balanced scale of moral and immoral actions where you can say, oh, this is a bad yeah. person? And I just don't do that. I talk about the actions themselves and not the person. Yeah. Um, but, okay, so the, there's, there's a lot to unpack. Wow. Incredible, isn't he? Astounding. It's almost as if you could see him realizing that he may be morally obligated to get rid of meat while also at the same time thinking about how fish tacos never sounded so good. His instincts seemed to kick in and he decided to dodge by carrying on for several minutes about absolutely nothing. Now, there are other ways to dodge by change, of course, such as flipping the burden of proof. Now, let's see how Matt masterfully flips the burden of proof to Cosmic in order to take the heat off of himself. And, and if you, you, I mean, you said a moment ago that you're almost, you, you're almost convinced that that is just objectively wrong, the, the factory farming industry. If it's the case that every single time you go to a restaurant, that's where your food's coming from, then, then what, it's not difficult to just choose something else on the menu. Sure. So why, why don't you do it? Who said I don't? Wow, that was an excellent dodge. That's one of Dillahunty's favorite dodges to use in his public debates. I'm still, I still don't get where the, where the moral obligation is coming in for someone who, you know, if, if you have a, a conditional statement, if X, then Y. If you're seeking well-being, then here's how you get to it. Solve it with God. The only problem with flipping the burden of proof to Cosmic Skeptic is that Cosmic was kind of in a position to call his bluff. To just choose something else on the menu. Sure. So why, why don't you do it? Who said I don't? Well, I mean, do you have, uh, have you eaten meat in a restaurant in the past week? I, I ate crab today at a restaurant. Yeah. So, so, but, so that means that, that, you, that you don't. That means that... Well, I don't think that the crab was factory farmed or harmed or, you know, in the, in the sort of immoral suffering that we're talking oh, about. I mean, like, have, have you eaten pork in the past week at a re at, like, that, that was not prepared by yourself or a friend in, in the kind of ethical manner that you're speaking of? Well, I was going to say probably not in the last week because I don't actually eat okay, that let, much. Let, let but me, I actually have because last night at the Thai restaurant I had pork. Okay, or, or we could just rephrase it. Yeah. So you may be asking, if you really did eat crab and pork within the last 12 hours... Why did he try to punk Cosmic on the defense by asking Cosmic how he knows that he didn't? Well, the answer is, in desperate situations, you need to just say whatever you can to get the heat off of yourself, even if what you say makes absolutely no difference. This is similar to how he did in his debate with Michael from Inspiring Philosophy. And I, I'm not just saying I don't know. I'm saying I don't know and you don't either, but you seem to be claiming that you do. How do you know I don't know? I don't know that you don't know. This is recent debate with Dr. David Wood. I would be completely correct in the sense that there's nothing about the universe that compels me to do that. I'm trying him. to locate the moral obligation for someone who says, um, I, just don't, I just don't care about those things. Or, we or I impose care about a moral obligation. No, no, that's what I mean. You are a, you're saying society imposes a moral obligation. The physical facts people. of the universe imposes a moral obligation. You for, just said for, that the universe no. doesn't impose. So you to are using God atheism no as an equate as being equal to fatalism. Where are you going? No. I'm headed. Where are you going? I'm headed towards extinction. That it, is the or, most. Or, is that, that is true the according most, to atheism? No, that's not where I'm going. We're not going. Is it a fact that ultimately humans will probably be that's extinct? That's all I'm saying. Yes. That's all I'm saying. So make sure you change the subject by dodging with change. Now. Here's your do's and don'ts for this tactic. Do, gradually change the subject and keep talking. 
The longer you keep talking, the better chance you have of getting them to follow your change of conversation or getting them to forget their point altogether. Don't answer incriminating questions directly or you can easily become the Dilla hunted. Tactic number three, dodge with blame. The mindset here is, I'm open to the change. It's the lack of evidence that's the blame. This one just may be my favorite of all of the other rules. Now, when you and I know that there just ain't no way you're gonna say goodbye to Golden Corral buffets for the rest of your one and only short and objectively meaningless life, but your opponent is asking what will change your mind, obviously, there is no way you're gonna change your mind. In situations like this, your guiding principle should be, if you want to dodge the shame, then just shift the blame. You just aren't personally convinced. This is easy. Let's watch the legend in action himself. Right, but, but even if it's not the single biggest thing you can do, the fact that it is something that you can do, and it's so easy, it, it's, it's not a difficult thing to do. Yeah, I'm just not convinced that it would have the effect that you say it does. But you can, I mean, would you see that it has a positive moral effect? Because then we've got a question which is, here is action X, which... Well, with respect to moral virtue, yes, I'm just not, con I'm just not convinced it's a moral duty yet. You know, in the process of drawing the lines and moving the lines, um, I'm not convinced if you're arguing that we should make eating meat illegal, now you're codifying rights for animals. Mm -hmm. And I understand why people want to do that. I'm just not necessarily convinced. I'm, I'm certainly not in that place right now. The second is to take attention off of the fact that you know you ain't changing your mind. And you do this by using the mere appearance of another social virtue, humility. You can do this by saying that you truly are open to changing your mind. The only problem is you just lack the simple data and evidence needed to do so. How that could possibly not fall within the category of obligation? I, I don't remotely disagree. The thing is... So you think it does fall within the category of obligation? Well, let me, let me finish this thought because I think the answer is yes, but I was... The only reason that I'm not convinced of that is because nobody's presented me the information to convince me that that is the single best thing somebody can do. That we don't, that we manage our surplus so that, yeah, no, but, yeah. and I haven't seen the data and I, I'm basically, I, I think I'm, I'm napkin doing math here uh, in a way that I, I can't and shouldn't. So as you can see, Always start by saying that you aren't convinced and hope that you don't get pressed on what it would take to personally convince you. If you do get pressed, make the criteria anything that can't come back later to bite you in your bum. If you give people a solid example of what would change your mind, then people will hold you accountable to it. And then guess what? When they provide the evidence to you, you have to change your mind in order to keep your social bling bling. So the trick here is to keep the standards unknown, internal, and as vague as possible. This allows you the ability to keep your street cred by telling people that you really are open to being convinced. Now, let's see Dilla Hunty use this tactic in action. So do you know, and I know like there doesn't need to be an answer to this question, because I know that this is a question that can come up with like the religion thing, and, and oftentimes it's a bit of a silly question, but just in case you do know of anything, do you know what it would take to make you stop eating animal products? Like, can, can you envision some learning of something or, or uh, something being the case such that you would stop? I, I, I come closer to give, being able to give specifics on this. Like when people say, what, what would it take to convince you that God exists? And my right, answer yeah. is always, I don't know, but if there's a God, it knows. It, well, you exactly. can't do that here. Yeah, yeah. Um, while I probably can't give specifics because... Because it's, Honestly, to say, it's, yeah. it, it's also not Until an issue it. I've spent that much time focused on the specifics about. And that is how you do the dodge. So here are the do's and don'ts for tactic number three. Do blame it on a lack of evidence in some way and don't give an objective criteria that will change your mind. If you must give a criteria, make your personal psychology the lone standard. Don't give an objective criteria no matter what. If the criteria becomes objective standards, then people can hold you to them. Now it's your turn. Will you be a Dilla Hunty or a Dilla Flunky? Let's find out. To recap, let's see if you can identify the dodging techniques we've discussed in this one short clip. 
I'm concerned about the oversimplification now, th- which is why I label it a moral virtue, because uh-huh. I could say I would probably be a moral, more moral person and probably to be doing more for the world if I just stopped eating meat. Never remotely denied that. The thing is, the factors that would keep me eating meat under some circumstance, not all, have so far outweighed the factors that would make me stop. And what are those factors, if you had to whittle them down? Uh, whittling them down is kind of difficult. Some, I mean, most of them we've talked about at some point in here. It is... So the climate change argument, by the way, is the strongest one of, of all of them for me personally. When other people presented this about, you know, the impact of this, I'm like, yeah, right. that's an issue. And if, if, if that's the case and I have accurate information, then yep, on board. But that's a separate issue from the moral, the types of moral arguments that I'm often presented with, which is, you know, oh, don't kill the poor animals. And the... One, one thing that happened, this is, this is a diversion, which hopefully will be clear and not, not seem that way. During the 2016 election here in the United States, I'm now a fairly left, fairly liberal, progressive, whatever, despite having been on the other side at one point. And yet I'm constantly trying to be measured and fair, even though I'm going to fail. And when people were talking about Trump and people voting for Trump, there were people on the left who were immediately like, you guys are racist. And I have friends who specifically voted for Trump because they got sick of being called a racist when in their mind, they're not. And we had to actually educate people on the difference between implicit and explicit racism. Uh, and we had to educate people on the difference between. Great job. Because you did so well and passed the test, you are now a master Dilla Dodger. You dodge. Because you dodge so hard, you now get access to our bonus dodge tool. This tool won't work on fellow atheists, of course, so it has to be used only on Christians and other kinds of religious people. This one may be the best tool that Matt has at his disposal. It takes tactic number one, the social fame tool, and utilizes it in a unique and powerful way. Are you ready for the fire tool? Well, all right. The tool is dodge with shame. The mindset here is, oh, you thought this was a game? Put some respect on my name. Now be quiet, only I'm allowed to whine and complain. If you watch Matt's debates with Christians and other theists, you'll notice that he uses all of the previously discussed tactics constantly. It's just far less obvious than it was with Cosmic. And the reason why is because he can't use the tool that I'm about to show you now against those who are on his team. If you mix this tool with the other tactics that we just learned, you have officially cracked the code to the success of Matt Dillahunty. This is a tool taken from the SJW playbook. As we've already established, if the social signaling and virtuous sounding claims are strong enough, then logical consistency becomes irrelevant or significantly unimportant. For example, although SJWs are painfully logically inconsistent, they still remain persuasive to millions of people. How is that possible? It's possible because SJWs aren't convinced by logical consistency, and so they aren't trying to convince others with it. The only thing that needs to be consistent is emotional social signaling. This is why it's acceptable to complain about intolerance and be incredibly intolerant while doing so. This is why it's acceptable to whine about equal rights and deny the people that you disagree with equal rights at the same time, and so on. Almost any modern social justice warrior can dodge a logical problem in their arguments like the Matrix by aggressively asserting an emotional appeal to injustice. This will be critical to your success. If you want to do the Dillahunty dodge successfully, it's important that you make sure to incorporate virtuous sounding statements that make it sound as though you're fighting against oppression and inequality. This will short circuit people's critical thinking faculties and make them feel that you have a much stronger case than you actually do. As a matter of fact, as I've said many times, if there is in fact a God and he's not a humanist, 
screw him. I don't care what he thinks. Can he squash me like a bug? Yes, but that doesn't make him more moral. Can he send me to hell? I will go to hell knowing that I was a morally superior to the thug that sent me there. The last one is another one that we've learned from psychological studies. If someone doesn't know what they're talking about and has really strong tone and body language, then people find them more persuasive than people who are experts in the field who really do know what they're talking about, but don't have that same tone or body language. Now, watch how Dillahunty tries to discredit his opponent's credentials by using this simple bully tactic. I'm a philosopher, so if we're talking about like a moral argument- I dispute argument, that, but- That I'm a philosopher? Yeah. I have a PhD in philosophy. And? Uh, <laughs> wow, brutal, right? And here's some other ways that Dillahunty convinces people, not by fact, but by body language. Right? And I think they're that pointless and meaningless because I'm looking at it from the big picture of here's the universe, here's us. It means I'm defective and that other people could be right. And so if you're talking about, um, if you're talking about God commanding this or God commanding that. Boy, he sure does look confident, doesn't he? Well, that does it. We've officially reached the end of the course. Now, for some other tactics that we didn't get to discuss today, like the power of not taking the burden of proof or staying so unclear that you can accuse everyone of a straw man will be made available in future courses. Now, Dilla Dodgers, I hope that this course has given you the confidence to go out and do the Dilla Hunty Dodge in situations where you know you aren't changing your mind and give off the appearance of being open-minded while doing a whole bunch of dodging. Until next time, keep on ducking and dodging, friends, and I'll see you next time.